Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the world's biggest stars. And we've got two for you today. The Feeling have got mega hits that I love to play on the radio and that you love to listen to. And they're back on tour this autumn from October the 14th, starting in Dublin through Cardiff to Norwich, Bexhill, Northampton, Birmingham, Glasgow, Newcastle, Manchester, Leeds, Bristol, Oxford and London 02, Shepherd's Bush on Friday at the 2nd of November 2018. The Feeling are back on the road and I'm delighted to say that Dan and Richard are with us now how are you doing i'm good thank you how are you i'm good but you got me into a lot of bother over the years i remember once being on bbc radio shropshire and i opened my show with love it when you call and a boss came in and Uh said could you turn it down a bit it's a bit raunchy for our radio station then i went to another station and they (laughs) they don't like it very much but they're perfect radio songs did you have that in mind when you wrote them no not really um just we just made the album that we wanted to hear you know, we made the kind of album that that uh, that that was the kind of music we wanted to listen to. Really, you know, just a bunch of lads playing music just together and just inspired by those sort of old records. But I suppose that we we you know we all grew up with with Radio Generation. We grew up listening to radio. You know, uh, we grew up with FM radio, and 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 the, I suppose the stuff we heard on the radio when we were kids was Queen and you know, kind of great radio pop music. So it's probably just kind of filtered in that way. Something like Love It When You Call that drum beat at the beginning is genius for radio and I guess live it's the same there's something about the pounding of that drum beat that moves our heart mm-hmm. isn't there it's kind of builds tension <laughs> that's the idea you know but you know you know something's coming you know and it's kind of the kind of thing we just played it wasn't even like a uh, you know you just when you're making music you're just following in your instincts you know you're just following whatever you feel like you want to do and you just go okay let's do this and there's not a lot of uh overthinking going on you're just making music you know and you know it's it's then the craft comes into finishing off a record and making it sound the way you want it to sound and all that kind of stuff. And 12 Stops and Home came very naturally to us. It was our first album and there was no expectations and no pressure on us. It was just five guys geeking out you know, being musicians, making a record. We're talking today to Dan Gillespie Sells, double barrel name, which means he's posh, and Richard Jones, less so. I look at your... So <laughs> not posh. <laughs> I look at your CV and, and when you started and the Brit School and that sort of period. I mean, the 90s was such a fabulous time. I, I think we're about the same age, all three of us. And that sort of Chris Evans on Radio 1 period was so exciting for music. I mean, did that give you a momentum too? Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, that was our formative years and we were we were growing up at that time. It's actually interesting because Dan and we were talking about when Absolute Radio 90s was launched however many years ago. And for some reason, we know every song that they play, even the menswear B-sides. It's like all the all the weirdest stuff. It sort of all permeates through when you're a teenager. And I think we were we were kind of lucky enough that we sort of came of age with our band in that mid noughties which was like a sort of like second wave of Britpop I, I, I was think of it was when bands sort of came back onto the radio again having not been on there was a bit of a pop period before that with boy bands and things yeah yeah, um, yeah. and that but we grew up with that like you know pop music but guys with guys or girls with guitars and yeah. singing harmonies and it being quite sophisticated as well that sort of sophisticated writing and it felt so exciting didn't it that period felt like yeah, it yeah. mattered it's somehow now with the charts I don't care is that because I'm an old geezer or is that because the business has changed and the charts are virtually irrelevant well, well unfortunately we're old geezers as well I so know. we can't really we have no we, it's quite hard to be objective it's care- <laughs> you have to be careful though don't you because I, I found myself not wanting to turn into a cliched ranty old man about how we're everything's not like it used to be but i really think it isn't as good yeah i feel like there's not much imagination i'm expecting more imagination from i'm just talking about in the mainstream like top streaming charts or whatever that is now the top 40 there's great music being made out there yeah of course but the thing that seems to be permeating the a-lists of um radio one and that sort of you know what kids are listening to predominantly a lot of it to me doesn't inspire me at all and that and I don't think it's just because I'm old, but maybe it is. Who knows? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> it's also the sound of it, isn't it? I'm in Vegas at the minute doing some taping and I was driving in a taxi listening to iHeart, which seemed to own everything in America. And they all just yeah. sound the same at the moment. There's some production or there's some way they're doing it. Whereas I guess the guys that are basically fundamentally vocals, bass, guitar, keyboards, that's never going to be the case because you've got to use the notes of the piano, haven't you? Radio goes through phases and things go through phases and the world is constantly evolving. And I think people are... The great thing about it is that because of the streaming services and various things, young people 
don't really, they, they'll get their music from everywhere. And they'll get their music from listening to 70s, 80s, 90s pop. They'll they'll listen to everything. And that's really lovely, actually, because I've, I've got a younger brother. He's 10 years younger than me. His music taste is so eclectic. It's not based on what he's being fed by Radio 1 or anything. It's just basically whatever he finds online. And he's listening to vintage music. There's, there's a, you know, there's like a whole... Uh, cave of beautiful old music out there that none of us have ever heard you know there's so much you can do to find find new sounds and new music and sometimes it's something that was recorded 50 years ago that suddenly kind of rears its head and everyone goes oh that's amazing you know and i love that you know i love that about about music you know there's always something to be discovered and it's interesting as well isn't it in our day if you got something viral you ended up in bed for three days now when it goes viral it can go (laughs) around the world and it changes everything literally one click in the right place and and i guess your music will live forever for that reason well well, yeah, and actually, I was talking about that um, Childish Gambino video that did that last weekend. It went up on a Saturday, and then by Monday, it had 40 million views or something like that. Yeah. And but because but because there's something like brilliant, it's a brilliant piece of art. That video, the way the song and the video together are something that's really interesting and really well done. And I love the fact that that can happen. It doesn't have to. It doesn't need anyone even promoting it. It's just people going. You got to see this. This is yeah. kind of cool, and it's very, spe- it's very, it's f- that I find very positive and very exciting that that can happen now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And certain certain things will find their way. They'll find their way to the top. You know. Tell me about the sexiest year of your career. I mean, late two thousand and five seems to have been a big period for you. When did you know you'd made it, and that suddenly you you were in your eyes at the top? Did you say sexiest year? Of sexiest our year. I'd well, say that. I, I think right that, now I'm feeling pretty sexy. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Do you know what? Two thousand six. Um, the album came out at the beginning of 2006 and suddenly the gigs that we were doing that used to just have our mates if we were lucky or just nobody out you know playing to to the t-shirt girls who were selling your t-shirts and you know that was it you know Um, those gigs suddenly were full of people and then before you knew it you're playing at a festival and everyone's singing your music back at you. And that's that's sort of like a a kind of watershed moment because you realise oh okay it's connecting you know, not only we've been played on the radio, but people are learning these songs and singing and singing back to us. And that was a real, a real shift for us, I think. And that all happened in 2006, beginning of that year. Nobody knew who we were. End of that year, everyone did. And it was, you know, the, the, we'd already had two number one radio records and, and another, you know, another to follow. And then, you know, the, 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 the album just seemed to sustain. It just seemed to keep giving you know, more and more hits and stuff. So it was, it was a real um, moment. And then as soon as that happened, we flew off to America and we went back to playing tiny venues in America, you know, and building it up in America and that. So it's a weird, it's a weird old life, you know, when you go from, from, from playing empty gigs to, to suddenly being able to sell out big, big theatres and you just have to kind of go with it, going on top of the pops and stuff like that the first time, you know, all those kind of like little watershed moments, they're the bits that are important and feel magical. But also at the time, you, we, we'd, we'd kind of were quite realistic because we were already in our mid-twenties and we'd already been session guys for a while. We'd already had record deal that fell through when we were in, when we were teenagers. We were already a lot older than a lot of the artists that, that had already had careers before us, you know, we were actually we were actually slightly older then than than was normal for a, a, ba- a band that were breaking. So we, we we weren't completely unrealistic about it, but there's still a lot of looking back at Twelve Stops and Home. There's still a lot of memories and a lot of you know part of what we wanted to do this tour for to to play Twelve Stops and Home live was was to kind of. Uh, honor those that that how important that time was for us you know and it's 12 years since 12 stops and home came out so why not why not do it now and i do believe the greatest compliment of success is survival i mean just still being here proves that you've made it that's got to be brilliant because they don't all survive do they yeah, yeah. Well, we, we did we never fell out was one of the big we, things yeah that was the thing we've all, we've we've all was carried on enjoying making music what is that are you so boring and inane between that. each other that you've got no passion what is it why are you still friends we shake hands at the beginning of every day good morning sir Good, Good yeah. morning, sir. How are you doing? Cup of tea, yes, please. One sugar. No, um, the thing is because we we met when <laughs> we all met when we were sixteen. We were so young. Yeah, we've been but mates we, for ten years before we, we started did, yeah, the band. But really. we didn't really get the band properly going and signed to a major. And it was actually the, probably the third band that we'd done. But we didn't get that the, get it right and get it signed until we were in our mid twenties. So we we already had ten years of struggle and 
living together and working together. So I think that if you're, you know, signed when you're 18 straight out of school or college and you've been with a band, because it often happens that you're with a band, a bunch of guys who've been working together for four or five months and then you're suddenly traveling the world, you don't really know. It's like dating someone, isn't it? You don't really know how well you're going to get on until you put under pressure. So we'd already it's been like that TV program where they get married. Married at f- married no married at first sight. <laughs> I prefer yeah, the like, naked oh, one myself. I, I want to see private parts yeah. before I move in with you. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Let's have yeah. a let's have well, a Well, we'd been through all of the private part stuff. Yeah, we've seen each other's turned, private parts. That's that's that's, that's how that yeah. was all out, out, out. Those premiere inns in Wigan, they can be fun nights, can't oh, they? Oh, yeah. We've seen it all. Absolutely. Kebabs all over the floor. No, never this. mind bloody premiere inn. That was, that was when you all lived together at uni. These, these oh, God, oh, yeah. It was like the young goodness, ones. Goodness, like the young ones. Is, yeah. Towers of pizza boxes. Oh, my God. Yeah. So the only, the only way was up. And also, you know what? I, I think un, unlike younger bands, I think we also appreciated... You know, because it was our second attempt as yeah, well. Yeah, we we realised what was happening was extraordinary, and it was living, literally living. We weren't going to take it for granted, you know. Yeah, we were living childhood dreams, and we weren't going to be like let's let's kind of ruin this because I want to be f- closer to the front than this guy, or why don't we use my songs or something yeah, like we that. We weren't going to let egos get in the way of the success. It was like more important that the band survive. And we just allowed Dan to have the ego. Yeah. Which was the- <laughs> well, because I was always going to win in the end. <laughs> yeah. Well, talking of which, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fluff his ego a bit. I'm from Nottingham and I went up to Sheffield to see a little play about a year or so ago called Jamie. And I just went oh. to see it again in the West End and it is one of the most beautiful shows I've ever seen. Well done, Dan. It is oh. true. Truly beautiful. Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. I'm, I'm very proud of it. Yeah, very proud of it. And we're delighted. I've, you know, the cast album came out just recently, and it's just so lovely to to have. You know, that that's going to be there forever. I mean, I hope the show lasts. I hope the show carries on in the West End as long as it can. But to know that that cast album will always be there. You know what I mean? It's it's not going anywhere. It's there. And you never in, know when you pick life. a subject like that. You don't know whether it's going to find its audience, whether the critics are going to like it or hate it. I just saw a show last week. I gave it five stars. Mark Shenton said it was the worst thing he'd ever seen. It's only opinion, isn't it? What you have to do is tell your story and hope that you do a good job and, you know, and hope for the best. And we, we know we, we would try to be as honest and, and as truthful as possible to the people of Sheffield, to the story, to the characters and make it just, you know, something that people just were going to enjoy more than anything else. It's a, it's a fun night at the theatre. What's know? the name of that 11 o'clock number with the lady who sings it in the second night? It is one of the most beautiful moments. Oh, it's called He's My Boy. And Josie Walker sings it incredibly. So if anyone hasn't seen it yet, get down there because she's she's not in the show forever. She gets recast fairly soon, and so we have to. I'm trying to get everyone to go and see Josie sing that song live because it's a it's a it's a real moment, isn't it? Everybody's talking about Jamie on in the West End, and then the feeling will be touring the UK from October 14th: Dublin, Cardiff, Norwich, Bexhill, Northampton, Birmingham, Glasgow, Newcastle, Manchester, Leeds, Bristol, Oxford, finishing in London, O2, Shepherd's Bush on the 2nd of November. I really love talking to you, Dan and Richard. It's been a pleasure, and uh, keep the hits coming, and Thank good luck you. with the tour. Thank you for your time. Cheers. Cheers Thank mate. you. Bye bye.